but by their conduct, not by their race or by their gender or their genitals or any other aspect of their physiology at all. And it actually does mention genitals in this, which I think is very nice. And um, that's wonderful. That's very important for members of the LGBTQIA plus community, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's very important, actually, because, uh, you know, people feel excluded if they don't kind of identify with the physiology they're born with. So there's a reason that the Buddha points all of this out. <laughs> I'm glad you all found that funny. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think there's something very deep in that. So do you want to start? Yes. Okay. I'm going to give over to someone else to use their voice. Yes. Okay. So... We're on page 182. The Buddha is speaking to the young Brahmin Vasetta. While among these many kinds of beings, their distinctive marks are determined by birth, among humans there are no distinctive marks produced by their particular birth not by the hairs or the head, nor by the ear or by the eyes, not by the mouth or by the nose, not by the lips or by the brows, not by the neck or by the shoulders, not by the belly or by the back, not by the buttocks or by the breast, nor by the anus or genitals, not by the hands or the feet, nor by the fingers or nails, not the knees or the thighs, nor the color or voice. Birth does not make a distinctive mark as it does for the other kinds of beings. In human beings with their bodies, nothing distinctive is found. Classification among human beings is spoken of by designation. Just pause. How long? All right, we're pausing in case there's any uh, need for clarification so far. One thing I'd like to say straight away is that obviously the Buddha, maybe not obviously, but it seems that the Buddha is comparing human beings to beings in other realms such as animals where the birth and the bodies are very distinctive that we can actually say they're a different species altogether and of course he's not saying there's no differences between human beings but he's saying they're not actually distinctive you know they don't um, render us any different we're all human beings there aren't different species there aren't different races actually in a concrete sense people um, with big noses there are people I mean, with big noses they can be a different species of no right it's stick out well as long as you're kind of embodied you're probably not a spaceman or something about that <laughs> so diana has something i don't know have you got a virtual hand just so we don't miss you next time i thought you i do have a virtual hand <laughs> human being or non-human being <laughs> um well, when I first saw this, I thought that's not true. Yeah. Human distinctive marks. They might have a birthmark. They might have a missing arm. You know, it could be some anything. <laughs> but I'm just, I skipped ahead and I see that it looks like the point of this status is how can you tell someone's a Brahmin? So maybe it, maybe the distinctive mark is kind of, maybe in the context that this was pulled out of before we yeah. got to the part where we come in. It says, how, what is the distinctive mark that shows you someone's a Brahmin? And then maybe that makes sense to me, but I don't know, but I'm just conjecturing. Right, right. I mean, certainly it's used in that context here, but I think that's just uh, to refute the idea of Brahmins and non-Brahmins altogether by saying that all human beings are essentially the same. And the only thing that really is of marked difference is our behavior, our action. And whether that ennobles or degrades us in a sense. So 
I think it's more than that. I think it's deeper than that. I think he's actually mm-hmm. saying that um, whatever distinctions we see are actually pretty irrelevant, pretty kind of minor, and they don't actually create, they don't, you know, mean that we're very different in, t- in the way that animals will be so different from each other. So I think the distinction here is actually between humans and animals, because he's saying there are um, many kinds of beings. And uh, what was the last thing? Classific- yeah, in human beings with bodies. I mean, maybe it means Earth does not make better. a distinctive mark as it does for other kinds of beings, right? So in the fourth verse there. Right. I see mm-hmm. it that way anyway. Yeah. But, Thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah. Because mm. they're kind of trivial, right? The differences that we see. We're all capable of full enlightenment. Even if you have big ears. That I get to hear. <laughs> In human beings with their bodies, nothing distinctive is found. Classification among human beings is spoken of by designation. The one among humans who lives by husbandry, you should know Vasitta, is a farmer, not a Brahmin. The one among humans who earns his living by various crafts, you should know Vasitta. He is a craftsman, not a Brahmin. The one among humans who lives by trade, you should know Vasitta, is a merchant, not a Brahmin. The one among humans who lives by serving others, you should know Vasitta, is a servant, not a Brahmin. The one among humans who lives by stealing, you should know, Vasetha, he is a thief, not a Brahmin. The one among humans who earns his living by archery, you should know, Vasetha, he is a warrior, not a Brahmin. The one who among, among humans who lives by priestly service, you should know, Vasetha, he is a priest, not a Brahmin. The one among humans who rules over village and realm, you should know Vasitta. He is a king, not a Brahmin. I do not call someone a Brahmin based on genealogy or maternal origin. He is just a pompous speaker. If he is impeded by these things, one who owns nothing, who takes nothing. He is the one I call a Brahmin. One who has cut off all fetters, who is indeed not agitated, who has overcome all ties, detached. He is the one I call a Brahmin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any comments or questions? Can we keep reading because it gets clearer as we go? Shall I go up a little bit? Where you want to keep going? Right. One who knows their past. Oops, sorry. Okay, I go back one. One who has cut off all fetters, who is indeed not agitated, who's overcome all ties, detached. They are the one I call a Brahmin. One who knows their past abodes, who sees heaven and the plain of misery, who's reached the destruction of births. They are the ones I call a Brahmin. For the name and clan ascribed to one is a designation in the world. Having originated by convention, 
it is ascribed here and there. For those who do not know this, wrong view has long been their tendency. Not knowing, they tell us, one is a Brahmin by birth. So this is quite interesting because it's actually referring to any sort of designation here, worldly designation, especially one that ascribes superiority or inferiority to essentially the same human beings that are not so very different from one another, actually has wrong view. So this is actually another definition of wrong view, which you don't hear in every sort of. So I think this is quite interesting, you know, and it's sort of, it's quite a strong warning that, you know, anybody who is ascribing sort of um, names and class and caste and superiority that could come around through race. I mean, Brahmins were a kind of race. They were fairer skinned people. Um, so there's a lot of racism in ancient India. And the Buddha is basically saying that that is wrong view because there are no essential differences between human beings. So I think this is a very um, clear and strong teaching that um, is, in a sense, very anti-racism and anti-genderism as well, anti-anythingism, right? And he's basically saying that we're all human beings. So wrong view has long been their tendency if we ascribe those designations. And then he carries on. One is not a Brahmin by birth. This is to be remembered that the Brahmins at that time were kind of the leaders of society. They were very elitist in a way, and they even had their own language. Did they speak Sanskrit at that time? They would have done. I don't know. I think Sanskrit is older than Pali, isn't it? It is older than Pali. They would so have I wouldn't be surprised. Scriptures in yeah, Sanskrit. Sanskrit. So they even had their own like perfectly crafted language, and that's what Sanskrit means, well-made, um, that was very elitist and exclusive. And there was a lot of pride around that and not so much care about their actions. So the Buddha's really kind of uh, pulling all that apart mm. by saying one is not a Brahmin by birth, nor by birth a non-Brahmin. So you can't actually be a lower caste or not from the elite caste by birth either because such thing is a designation, a convention that's uh, originated uh, in the world Mm -hmm. also very specific mm -hmm. a brahmin he defines as someone who has cut off all fetters yeah so it is an aria right well aria you get there. Yeah. But, yeah 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 all yeah. oh, right cut off all fetters who is indeed not agitated ah. who has overcome all ties yeah so he's redefining yeah what mm -hmm. What is a Brahmin? Yeah. And he often did that, like taking a term that was wrongly used and then finding a better way to use that term in a, a more true way mm. that was actually helpful and part of a, a teaching that he gave. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, are we here now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm. One is not a Brahmin by birth, nor by birth a non-Brahmin. By action, one becomes a Brahmin. By action, beco one becomes a non-Brahmin. One becomes a farmer by action. By action, one becomes a craftsman. One becomes a merchant by action. By action, one becomes a servant. Uh, one becomes a thief by action. By action, one becomes a soldier. One becomes a priest by action. By action, one becomes a king. So that is how the wise see action as it really is. Seers of dependent origination, skilled in action and its result. By action, the world goes around. By action, the population goes around. Sentient beings are fastened by action, like the linchpin of a, mu a moving chariot. By austerity, by the spiritual life, by self-control, by inner taming. By this, one is a Brahmin. This is supreme Brahminhood. 
And just before the uh, sitter class, because I hadn't had time to look at it, I wondered if that word action would be actually a translation of kamma. And indeed, Matthias has just told me that it is. So, um, yeah, it's action that is kamma. And I think it's a great translation because kamma is something that's, you know, constantly evolving, constantly being created, being made. And um, it's very similar to this uh Sutta, the uh, the two kinds of thought, Majjhima number 19, where it says that what we frequently think and ponder upon becomes the inclination of the mind. And here the Buddha is saying it's by action that one becomes, for example, a soldier. So this is how the verbal action becomes the way you think. The physical action becomes actually who you are in a sense, right? We create ourselves out of what we do. I remember when I was a teenager, you know, my mom used to say, oh, Maybe you'll be a teacher or you'll be a such and such. And I used to think, think, why do they call people who teach teachers? Why don't they just say, I teach? Mm. You know, why do you have to define yourself by mm. what you do? Mm. It just seems really strange. Like, I am a such and such. Mm. I used to find that really silly because it's obviously just a role that you play in a sense, right? And I mean, it's important for me to understand that. And hopefully other people around me to understand that in my role now because it's, Otherwise, it's like, oh, this is the abbot or this is the senior nun. But it is just a post, if you like. It's a designation. It's a particular role that you play. Mm -hmm. But it's not who you are by any means, even though you may become that person if you identify too mm -hmm. much, right? So um, it's also obviously gives room for a lot of uh, fluidity, you know, that a soldier could, you know, change their job and start to... Uh, act as a thief or act as a farmer and then they become a farmer <laughs> so it's nothing fixed it's what we do that makes us what we are it's just a, a game we play a role we play mm. yeah in a, in a way it is and yet it also does have results right mm. so we have to be careful about the ethical intention behind the action but this is interesting. So that's mm. how the wise see action as it really is. Seers of dependent origination, skilled in action mm. and its result. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand there's an action and then there's a result mm. of that action. And this is where wisdom comes in to try mm. to, um, you know, act from a place that's motivated by kindness, compassion, virtue. Right? Mm. Some actions are ethically uh, unwholesome. Other actions are ethically wholesome. So taking care of the quality of our intention and our actions of body and speech mm -hmm. are really, really key. Yeah, because you could take on these roles but be unethical in it. Right. You could wear a robe, but oh, yeah. uh, just because you are wearing a robe does not necessarily yeah. mean you are worthy. Right. To be a, you know, to be being a yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. I mean, ideally, the way you appear to the world is what you really are, who you really are inside, right? So at least in the example of monastics, the robe is supposed to mean something. It's supposed to mean a certain standard of sila and at least a training toward that standard of sila, a, a sincere training towards it. Even if you're not perfect yet, you know, it's not that you put on the robes and become an hour hat overnight. Otherwise, wow, it'd be so easy, wouldn't it? <laughs> Everyone should ordain and get out of samsara. But uh, yeah, that's really true. You know, you can be a soldier who's ethical or unethical. You can be a priest who's ethical or unethical. It's um, it's not determined by the job so much as by how you go about it. So Diana wants to um, contribute something. Yeah, thank you. I was, first of all, I just wanted to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you say that the word action in this um in this reading is comma in mm -hmm. the Pali. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also, wouldn't it be possible to be a farmer and practice austerity, a spiritual life, self-control, and entertaining? Absolutely. Yeah doesn't have to be one or the other right right absolutely yeah I think he's just using these as examples of how um one isn't a Brahmin by birth but only through action and then he's just using the farm you become a farmer by action in other words you become a farmer by farming right 
um, you become a craftsman by acting as a craftsman, if you like. You become a Brahmin as acting as a Brahmin should, which is to be ethical and noble and free from all defilement. So he's just using that as an example, but it's not exclusive at all, no. Hmm. It's, it's by action that one becomes uh, wise as well. And, of course, it's not only the monastics or people who have a religious livelihood that can become wise. It's how we go about whatever we do. And in the Buddha's day, there were many, many enlightened people in the lay life as well as the uh, monastic life, or at least until the third stage of liberation. And there's some discussion about that. But apparently, you know, if you are an anagami and you're a lay person, you actually, well, say if you become fully enlightened, then you have to take the road. But I think that really means that there's just no fuel to continue the life process if you don't have much of a purpose in the world. So the idea of taking robes means basically um, your purpose becomes teaching the Dhamma, your purpose becomes living the Dhamma. And uh, perhaps that's how I understood living the Dhamma in its fullest. You have to renounce. I can't imagine that you wouldn't renounce even long before that. Yeah. Yeah. So certainly, no, there's no contradiction there. Although on the other on the previous page, you mm. also had to have cut off all feathers, <laughs> feathers, right? <laughs> Be agitated, know your passive boats, and all those things. So you probably would have taken robes to get the right. Fire. Probably, so, probably. <laughs> you're out in the field all day farming. Right well, now. who knows? I mean, it's not that you have to know, you know, see the heaven and hell, and I don't. Mm. You even have to see past lives to become fully enlightened. I don't know. I'm just saying, I don't know. You may. Um, I think it's something that would naturally happen but then not all our hats have the psychic powers so that is considered one of the Atumina Sadamnas, one of the psychic powers so who knows if that's necessary I think he's probably um, in a way trying to put that Brahmin down a touch by saying well you know you haven't done this, you haven't done that all you're doing is like designating yourself something superior when actually there's no distinction between you and any other human being and you know it may well be that this particular Brahmin is worse than other human beings in terms of his ethical conduct. So it's probably a bit of a, a kind of, hey, look in the mirror and reflect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Can you say a little? Yes. Um, right. So she's just... Same yeah, I, I really enjoy this sutta because also growing up, I always thought of social constructs like um, if I am in Africa, no one calls me black because everybody's black that actually doesn't exist at all. Yeah. Then you go into a different country, maybe you go into a place where they don't have black people, they ask you kind of where are you from, what are you, they don't know what to call you. Then you might go to the UK or America, then you're definitely <laughs> like that. So um and, and same for um things like classes where you go into one country, then you're lower class, you go to a different country and you're very upper class there because you've got much more money <laughs> than other people. So yeah, I've, uh, uh it's uh it's really nice that um this sutta kind of points out to the truth that these things are just, um, they're there for convention. And I used to reflect a lot on why do people feel the need to classify. to classify? And I think it's not necessarily coming from an unwholesome place. They might ask you, where are you from? Because they're wondering what's the way to address you in a respectful mm -hmm. way, maybe in your culture. <laughs> People like to be greeted in a particular way. Maybe people like to eat particular foods, but then that also easily becomes negative. They think because you're from this place, because you're this skin color, because you look like this, then you must uh, like eating this. You must be like this. You must. Mm. So, it's, so it's very easy for that to become really unwholesome as well. Um, you know, people might think, "Oh, you're not Asian, so why would you like meditation?" <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed this sutta just for um 
pointing out the truth and strengthening it in my mind mm. and um, hearing it from you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's really interesting what you say about context, you know, like we don't think about our skin color if it's the same as everybody else, for example. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about traveling because I never thought about that either. And then when I went to India, suddenly I became a Westerner, which basically meant a white person, right? But also someone from the so-called West. It sort of it had a certain connotation that just didn't hold true over here. Because, you know, you can be working class also. I think I was kind of a mix of working and working and middle class. Uh, but I never thought about that. But then suddenly in India, it was like you were a Westerner, so you were seen a certain way. And what I noticed as well is that um, they presumed that because you're from a Western country, you must have like a higher education. And then I told them I actually hadn't done a degree. And I remember it was really funny because there's this one Western guy, one white guy, right, who um, people really looked up to, the Indians sort of looked up to because it was kind of good for their image to associate with white people. It's very racist in that sense. Um, and then they asked him what he did and he said he was a farmer. And they were almost horrified and sort of backed right off, almost ashamed to hang out with him anymore <laughs> because of these classifications, again, that people make, you know. So I used to find it quite interesting that people reacted to me one way when they thought I had a degree and a different way when they found out I didn't. And I thought, well, I'm just as intelligent as whether I do or don't. So it's just a judgment based on those kind of conventions, yeah. So I think sometimes the traveling can really, really help to um, put a context to these things and make us realize, yeah, there is no kind of fixed value that anything has, race or gender or sexual orientation. Some countries apparently are matriarchal. Who knows? <laughs> apparently. Um, so, yeah, different times, different eras. It's so conventional yeah yeah thanks for sharing that miss hi i uh, just wanted to mention it is quite funny actually about um i, I can't remember her name you know who says when I am in Africa, I'm black and nobody cares nobody notices mm. when I go to the Gambia I'm white here, I'm just Lise. But it is interesting because you speak about, you know, um, physical characteristics such as gender, uh, color, skin color, and so on and so forth. But what about age? Uh, and that is, um, I, I mean, in the UK and in France, um, a very strong um trying to be discreet uh parameter by which you are judged by which you are uh, discriminated against or patronized <laughs> and um i i kind of knew about it but i'm not 20 anymore and i get it more and more and i've got to say it's not easy it sort of overrides everything else you know and uh, yeah, it's an experience which um, we tend to to skip, but uh, we shouldn't because it is um, it is quite deep in people's psyche. And I think being able to uh, sort of classify people, uh, as someone said, it, it kind of tells you you know that the behavior to to adopt with this kind of people and that's what they expect but in fact it's what I expect of them rather than the other way around mm -hmm. um, and, and that is an important difference mm -hmm. it is your own projection that you put on yeah. a group of people not these people who expect you to treat them a certain way but you uh, the way you perceive them and so on, you know, is um, is your projection, not their characteristics. Right. Mm. Yeah, and that goes to so much of life, doesn't it? Our projections about what we think somebody means or... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whether we think they're like, I don't know, aggressive or just assertive or... 
Yeah, and it varies with your moves as well, and with the context, the social context, and so on and so forth. It, it's a lot um, deeper than um, that. What we want to to acknowledge. It's um, yeah. I, I used to teach that in psychology, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, prejudices and yeah. how they come about and why. You know, and right. that used to fascinate me. Mm. It's really tricky, isn't it? Because if we knew we were prejudiced, we could do something. But the thing is about bias is it's implicit; it's hidden. It's yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to have it, you know, as long as we're not enlightened, there's going to be that judgment not based on a person's qualities, a person's action, a person's virtue. There's going to be other kinds of judgment there, which do tell us about ourselves. It's not necessarily the case that it's entirely projection, but a projection will be involved. And, to uh, a great extent, yeah. I would say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, even with the age thing, you know, like I can't, um, you know, imagine how it might feel yet, because I've not, I don't know, I guess there is a difference in how people treat me now than how they treated me when I was younger. But I don't yet know how it will play out when I'm 70 or 80, if I make it that far, you know. And I think <laughs> also conditioned by our societies, like in some cultures, the older you are, the more revered you become. Or in some, uh, like old monks tend to get a lot of reverence. I've noticed that, like monks, that is. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, old nuns are not so cool or attractive, I think. It's like, oh, they're sort of spent. But sometimes a monk ordains in later life, in Ajahn Brahm, yeah. which is very well supported, they might be 60 or so, and they're tall and they're old, and immediately everybody presumes they're much more senior to, like, a younger nun, right, even if they've been in rows for 20 years. Immediately, mm. like, this sort of, you know, old monk gets all the kind of credit for being wise so I don't know it, it's so conditioned and most of the time yeah we're just kind of making our way in life with all kinds of projections and assumptions that probably stop us from getting to really know one another at a deeper uh, now the question is if you don't want to play this game mm -hmm. now just try to think if somebody said who are you we haven't got a hope Yes, you're just you. And you play in the hand of prejudices. You say, I'm a woman, I'm 100 years old, I am. Mm -hmm. In fact, you, you build up the, this collection, this set of, uh, of um, things, of factors, which the other person's mind is saying, oh, well, she's 100 years old, she can't run marathons, uh, she probably doesn't know what is a smartphone, uh, she's a woman, oh, well, and all the prejudices which goes with that. How do you describe yourself? Do you see what I mean? It's difficult. Well, I think we have to use conventional language and not be too yeah. about it. I mean, it's this thing about, you know, we do have identities and there are going to be certain experiences attached to those, you know, in experience as well as experience of the way the world responds to us. But holding it lightly, you know, and holding it with compassion for ourselves and for the other person, because we have to live in the bodies we have. I mean, we can't kind of say, well, I'm just not going to tell you what my gender is or what my name is or <laughs> not hide our age. So I think it's just about understanding that, you know, we're working in this realm of conventional truth um and there is an impact you know there are conditions that do a response but it's about holding it all compassionately and um not taking it personally I think and have trying to have more compassion and more awareness of our minds when they tend to judge I'm gonna yeah. move on a little bit um possibly with the next sort of there's no more comments on this but uh yeah it's a massive topic isn't it it's a really massive topic. What do you think? Shall we keep going with it? Or are there more comments or things to say around that? Carry on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vague nods. You want to read the next bit? Okay. Yeah. Beads make an outcast. The 
blessed one said to the Brahmin Agi, Agibhara Dvaja, Do you know, Brahmin, what an outcast is or the quality that makes one an outcast? I do not know, Master Gautama, what an outcast is or the qualities that makes one an outcast. Please let Master Gautama teach me the Dhamma in a way that I may come to know what an outcast is and the qualities that makes one an outcast. In that case, Brahmin, listen and attend closely. I will speak. Yes, sir, the Brahmin Akibhara Dwaja said. The Blessed One said this. A person who is angry or hostile, an evil denigrator, deficient in view, a hypocrite, you should know him as a outcast. One who injures a living being whether once born or twice born, who has no kindness towards living beings, you should know him as an outcast. One who extols themselves and despises others, inferior because of their own conceit, you should know them as an outcast. A scold, stingy, of evil desires, miserly, a deceiver, one without moral shame or moral dread, you should know them as an outcast. One who reviles the Buddha or his disciple, a wanderer or householder, you should know him as an outcast. One is not an outcast by birth, nor by birth is one a Brahmin. By action, one becomes an outcast. By action, one becomes a Brahmin. Mm. Uh, Sean, Sean. Hello. Hi. Um, I just had a couple of questions. So, first of all, what does it really mean by deficient in view? Does it just mean wrong view, or is that is there something else that that means? Right. Um, Where is that? Deficient that's view. right. In First of the stanza, if you like. Okay, so, yeah. Deficient in view, I mean, is wrong view, but I wonder if here they're talking about a particular view that's prejudiced as well, because it seems to be referring mainly to this kind of sense of putting somebody else down um, as inferior, you know, and maybe even putting another person down as an outcast, right? Um, mm. That it's actually them who are an outcast. So I think, yeah, it's deficient in view mm. as in, obviously no right view because we all are deficient in view to that extent but I think it's particularly deficient in the sense that you know someone doesn't know what a real outcast is oh, okay you know, and it looks down on others and when it says whether once born or twice born mm. does that mean in terms of number of lives what does it mean one who injures a living being, whether once born or twice born. Do you know what it means, once born or twice born? What is a twice born being? Who has no kind? I'm pretty sure twice born means an egg. The animals that are born oh, in yeah, egg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, That's true. true. That's okay. True. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so whether it's actually a being that's come out of the egg or whether it's come out of the egg. yet to come out of the egg? 
Or it's come out it's of the egg and the right and the mummy who laid the egg. Okay. Right. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of blurred over that, thinking it was some kind of um idea that the Brahmin has about themselves, you know, like a one spawn Brahmin or a twice spawn Brahmin, I don't know. Mammals versus birds, interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was just one reflection as well. I think you just kind of said it though. It was just just occurred to me how, when you're reading it how normally it is the reverse, isn't it? Those who think they're more important mm -hmm. make other people feel like outcasts. Whereas yes. this step saying, no, actually mm -hmm. you're the outcast. So exactly. Exactly. Yes, it's turning it around, isn't it? Because this person doesn't know what you know, this Brahmin comes and he doesn't know what is an outcast or the qualities that make one an outcast. And most probably he's another one of these proud Brahmins, right? So the Buddha's turning it all upside down. It's, yeah, exactly that. It's not you who's, it's not the other person. It's actually you who sees them as an outcast that's the outcast. Yeah. And that's, again, projection in a sense, right? I mean, have you noticed in yourselves? I've noticed. But sometimes when we think someone else is angry, actually we're angry about that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> this person's really angry. Yeah, it's really beautiful how he turns things around back to ourselves again and again and again. Right? Look at your mind, look at your mind. How is that behaving? How is that, you know, mm -hmm. is your mind with these beautiful qualities or conceit and, you know, despising others? Yeah. It's pretty harsh in a sense, right? Angry, hostile, evil, denigrator, a hypocrite. <laughs> so it's kind of, yeah. Did someone have a... Oh, no. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I had the same question as uh, once born or twice born, but then I googled it, and in Sutta Center and in Wikipedia, <laughs> it says the once born, uh, the twice born concept is, uh, you know, the one first born is physically, and the later date is born the second time. That is a spiritual born. So that is a traditional oh. Hindu kind of a concept they had right. i wondered uh-huh yeah like they've been sort of baptized or they're sort of yeah again super yeah so you go into the school for vedic studies and then you become kind of a you know you are a spiritual you know mm -hmm. the kind of studies like confirmation yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 that makes sense mm -hmm. so even if they've not been twice born in other words but you shouldn't harm them yeah 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 Makes sense. Could see it both ways and include everyone. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I mean, the sad thing is, it seems like in that time the Buddha really had a lot to say to sort of try to bring the Brahmins out of their superior view. But even now, it's the same. You know, it's exactly the same. Right. Brahmins look down on everyone else. I mean, not all Brahmins, right? I don't want to say all Brahmins do that, but generally speaking, that's a caste that deems itself higher and superior by birth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, you see how the um, so called, I don't know what to call them, actually. The, uh, and bed carites, I guess, but what's that lower caste actually called nowadays? Because Harijan's not the right word, and untouchables is not the right word because it's just a horrible word. But anyway, those people who are deemed untouchable, um, you can see why this was just ah, someone's telling the truth, you know, somebody's giving us a sense of dignity and self respect. And um, it's surprising that these aren't actually. Suttas that are more famous in a way. Mm -hmm. Children of God is actually not very much liked by those people because it seems quite patronizing. But I guess it depends on each individual, right? It's just like with, with any group, some people would prefer one label to another. But I think that was quite old and dated, and there were a lot of problems with that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I don't know how much more you'd like to um, go through today, but we could continue. They're all on pretty much a similar theme. Should we do that? Yeah? Hmm. Or we do? Unless you have anything else to say about the last one? Do you want to say more? Okay. So let's go to the next one, which is from the Anguttara Nikaya number 470. And this is called the state. So when kings are unrighteous, this is another cause and effect process, I think. When kings are unrighteous, the royal vassals, what are they, become unrighteous? The people serving the king, perhaps? When the royal vassals are unrighteous, Brahmins and householders become unrighteous. When Brahmins and householders are unrighteous, the people of the towns and countryside become unrighteous. When the people of the towns and countryside are unrighteous, the sun and the moon proceed off course. Isn't the sun getting hotter? Wow. It's getting hotter. They are. When the sun and the moon proceed off course, the constellations and the stars proceed off course. Mm. When the constellations and stars proceed off course, day and night proceed off course. The months and fortnights proceed off course. The seasons and the years proceed off course. That's a bit spooky. Seasons proceeding off course. When seasons and years proceed off course, the winds blow off course and at random, when the winds blow off course and at random, their de the deities become upset. When the deities are upset, sufficient rain does not fall. When sufficient rain does not fall, the crops ripen irregularly. When people eat crops that ripen irregularly, they become short-lived, ugly, weak and sickly. Oh dear. <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. But <laughs> there's hope. When the kings are righteous, the royal vassals become righteous. And I'm sure we can start from the next sentence if there are no kings. <laughs> when the royal vassals are righteous, Brahmins and householders become righteous. Let's start there at least. When Brahmins and householders are righteous, the people of the towns and the countryside become righteous. When people of the towns and countryside are righteous, the sun and moon proceed on course. When the sun and moon proceed on course, the constellations and stars proceed on course. When the constellations and the stars proceed on course, day and night proceed on course. The months and fortnights proceed on course. The seasons and years proceed on course. When the seasons and years proceed on course, the winds blow on course and dependently. Dependent. Dependent. Huh? Dependably. Dependably. Dependent. Dependably. When the winds blow on course and dependably, the deities do not become upset. When the deities are not upset, sufficient rain falls. When sufficient rain falls, the crops ripen in season. When people eat crops that ripen in season, they become long-lived, beautiful, strong and healthy so there you go that is the incentive to live righteously <laughs> mm. and then there's a lovely little passage just to say before i read the next little passage this is a very much expanded version of the importance of kalyanamitta isn't it and right wise association you know seeing the consequences of what happens without that wisdom that wise association and righteous if you like examples in leadership roles it all goes wrong in a really serious way and we can see that happening in the world today whether or not we believe that you know um that it's because the deities are upset that the winds uh yeah the winds blow of course and then the deities get upset and then sufficient rain does not fall but the fact is if the winds blow of course and all the other things that happen sufficient rain does not fall and I can imagine those poor deities are kind of crying their hearts out, probably, especially those that live in the clouds. Whether or not you believe that, you can see some of the sequence happening here. Huh? I think Mother Earth indeed is upset. And um, I mean, if we believe in a sense, or if we can sense that 
things are energetic, right? Mm. Then, yeah, the energy is certainly out of sync. Mm. So, and you know, the difference between eating this um, unseasonable crops that ripen irregularly and eating crops that ripen in season. I mean, most of the time we're eating imported food, right? That's not mm. happening in England right now, like blueberries every day. <laughs> Where are the blueberries at this time of year? Where is the, I don't know, even the oranges or uh, most of the fruits that we have? Yeah. Mm. And I think it has been shown that, you know, fruit that's in season or crops that are in season are a lot more healthy. You can try your organic stuff, but I think even just the seasonal stuff is probably as important. So the next little um, poem. When cattle are crossing a ford, if the chief bull goes crookedly, all the others go crookedly because their leader has gone crookedly. So too among human beings, when the one considered the chief behaves unrighteously, other people do so as well. The entire kingdom is dejected if the king is unrighteous. I know a lot of people in countries with unrighteous leaders or with the fear of unrighteous leaders coming into power, wanting to run, wanting to scarper, you know, feeling ashamed, feeling totally dejected and really distressed. And um, I think many countries, including our own, perhaps have suffered in this way, you know, with political changes in the last years. So, of course, they become dejected. And that's even where perhaps we're not under direct threat. But imagine in places where, say, Myanmar, where the military has seized a really bloody rain. I mean, it's just it's it's a genocide on its own people people are certainly more than dejected you know they're not even able to live in their own country there's so much um, fleeing from that country and uh, places that really can't sustain those populations you know places that are flooded and where there's no food and there's so much disease so i'll just finish the little poem and then come to you down if that's okay just keep your train of thought there. When cattle are crossing a ford, if the chief bull goes straight across, all the others go straight across because their leader has gone straight. So too among human beings, when the one considered the chief conducts themselves righteously, other people do so as well. The entire kingdom rejoices if the king is righteous. Yeah, that's a whole other thing, isn't it? The importance of leadership. Mm -hmm. Diana, can we come to you? Thank you. Hi. Yeah, that's that's what I noticed from the very beginning of the um passage was it starts with kings. Mm -hmm. So the kings are responsible for how everybody else behaves and I'm not sure if I agree with that or if I think it's beneficial although the Buddha said it um so I'm not arguing <laughs> but I've often thought that in terms of our government like the government sets the tone we don't have kings now but we have kind of a government that will set the tone for how we should behave or how we should what our values should be. And it is true that it does have an impact for sure. Yeah. I think that's maybe the difference there because I wouldn't read this as the Buddha saying kings are responsible for everybody else. I wouldn't read it that way. I think he's very clear that we're responsible for ourselves, but I think he's saying it has an impact, you know, and it's more likely that people will be common righteous. It doesn't necessarily mean all people either, but it does tend to, like you say, set the tone, you know that it's more likely that if we see the people at the top of society behaving a certain way, we start to behave that way too. Not only because we're influenced, I think, but also because sometimes you actually almost have to kind of play the rules. You know, it's like you, if something is really um, um, corrupt, you have to find your own ways of getting around it, right? 
And then you start thinking in those ways too. Perhaps well motivated in the beginning, but eventually, you know, it's like that's one of the problems in politics. People come in with the best of intentions, but the situation they're in means they have to compromise their ethics to a great extent. They don't have a lot of choice sometimes. You know, it's one of they might choose the lesser evil, but they're still having to choose a decision that causes harm. So I don't know, but I think, yeah, there's no doubt we all influence each other. And unfortunately, these days, especially if you are in um, a very prevalent position, you also get a hell of a lot of exposure, <laughs> you know, on the news or in the papers, the press. And I'm often saying, you know, to people close to me, but by watching the news all the time and hearing what these people say, they're actually inviting these people into their home, you know. Mm -hmm. And even if they're determined not to be the same, they still get very irate and very upset and affected by those people. So it doesn't bring out the best in them. So, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate, but I think as conditioned processes, we think we've got more control than we have. And we are influenced by the, the people who run our societies. Yeah. I think maybe the context of this was he was talking to a king or he was mm -hmm. trying to inspire kings to behave well because that of everybody that will be affected. Yeah. I don't know the context because I haven't read the full thing, but um, right. yeah, I don't know. I mean, he's clearly saying there's a, a causal relationship here. I think it's another causal sequence that he's... Um, you know, uh, just drawing out in a, a much wider context to say that can actually influence the, the weather, the sun and the moon, etc. So yeah, it's a particularly powerful influence that a person's having. Then he comes to Minori. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that as well. And then I was kind of relating the kings of that era are the leaders, the political leaders of this era. And they are the ones who are setting up the policies. They are the ones who are approving the climate change or whatever thing. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who are uh, going to war and, you know, you know, doing all these things. So, so when the kings are, you know, bad, then the whole, you know, system, as um, Shirley said, the Mother Earth itself, you know, everything, you know, gets affected. So that is how I kind of, linked yeah. it to the today society mm. yeah 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 i mean even we do have a king <laughs> i don't know how much influence they have but i think you know it does affect our minds we think i mean king charles i think he's sort of okay i mean i don't agree with royalty but he's not a bad person i mean there's maybe some sides of him that are quite okay i don't know but imagine if he was really corrupt I think it would affect our psyche but yeah you're right it wouldn't have the same sort of power in terms of policy making and you know sending people to war however they do hoard a whole lot of money <laughs> that could be used in better ways according to my own personal view um so we only have a couple of minutes so but I'll come to Liz and then we'll start to wind up but then again if we are very mindful, there is a sutta, and I can't remember the reference of this sutta, where he says, others will whatever, mm. but we will not. And that, for me, that sutta is very important. I think about yeah. it a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, I hear gossip, and you know, in my mind, say, others will gossip and I will not, and I find something else to do. Uh, yeah. And that is also for that. We don't have to follow. We have to be mindful. They set the condition, but that can be positively as well, because Asoka, he, he had all these uh, Buddhist uh, quotes uh, all over the place and so on. So it can be both ways. But if we are mindful, we don't necessarily have to be influenced by that um mm. you know again this sutta others will i will not and that is um, a very important sutta i think yeah. yeah it is a very important sutta um 
<laughs> yeah, thanks, Matthias. I just tried to type in the reference. It's eight or nine, I think, but it's called effacement. And yes. I think in that sutta, I mean, the Buddha's not actually saying you won't be influenced. He's just giving us a way to make a kind of determination to, yeah. to make a commitment to not going down the wrong route. And sometimes, yeah, we can see people going down the wrong route and it gives us more kind of determination not to do the same. But at the same time, we are influenced and he emphasized the importance of wise friendship and as the most fundamental aspect of the path. You know, wise friendship is a whole of the spiritual path. And yeah, I think I in that case, you know, he's saying the importance of being around wise teachers and at least having the influence of the Buddha. But yeah, in a sense, your sutta, the sutta you referred to, is one of your wise teachers. So that will certainly help. Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult, though. I mean, I think especially if you're around only, you know, people who do harm, I think it would affect you, even if you wouldn't, if if that wouldn't translate into body or speech. I think it would affect the mind. It would be very difficult. Oh, I agree with you, but uh, it, it is to do with mindfulness and I think, you know, sort of setting your boundaries and the precept. If nothing else, grab the precept and hold on tight because it's um, uh, it is easy to get influence. But if you say I'm going to limit, you know, right speech, that's not right speech, or uh, right that is that definitely is not right action, and you back off and you know you you try to dissociate yourself, not to be um, drawn by that. But yes, of course, it will be. Uh, a little scar tissue there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so there's a comment in the chat. I oops, where's it gone? I purposely don't watch the news and don't read newspapers. It's mainly negative. Yeah. I notice people that follow news in detail seem to be more worried and negative following up from Venerable's point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it actually triggers a fight flight response, especially a feeling of helplessness as well. Like you can't actually process the fight flight response if you um, are constantly getting that same input. And also there's nothing you can do about it, right? Because we're kind of trying to have that response in order to find a solution. And if there is no solution, <laughs> I think it can lead to depression in the end, you know, it leads to the collapse, the freeze response, which is just you give up, you feel helpless. And I've noticed too that not only are they more worried, but they also can become more helpless and feeling a loss of hope. And that's really, really sad because uh, there's always something we can do. As Liz said, you know, we can determine to be different and we can put a lot of effort into being different and including associating with wise people, but actually, um, being more careful about our speech, doing beautiful things in the world, you know. I mean, for me, I've seen how the world has become so much, I felt it as a teenager, very, um, what's the word, these nuclear families, you know, very divided, and we don't just allow people into our homes, we're not very generous, we tend to be suspicious, and I thought, you know, I don't want to live like that, I want to actually share whatever I have, I'd like to have a place that people can come, that people can share whatever resources I have. And in a way, that's what I'm trying to do, right? Even they're not my resources, they're offered. So it's just including everybody. And it's much harder, much harder than me just, you know, going to uni and getting a job and looking after myself. This is way harder because I'm depending on so many other people. And um, But I think it's worth it, you know, that there's somewhere people can come to no matter who they are and they don't have to pay a fee to get through the door. They can just come and join in with whatever's happening here. So, yeah, I do think we lose a lot of our energy on um, wrong association, which I consider news to be a part of. Yeah, isolationist. Yeah, that's true, Diana. That's a good word. Um, uh, someone else says, I try to read the news as a way to develop loving kindness and compassion to others, but it's very challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I kind of feel like I know how much suffering there is. I mean, obviously not in such a depth that I'm enlightened, but 
I kind of don't need to read the news to develop loving kindness and compassion. Uh, for me, the best way to develop loving kindness and compassion is to practice it and to, um, yeah, to actually cultivate it. And uh, I guess sense into the suffering that's inside. I think there's probably enough for me to go on personally. But yeah, sometimes it's good to um, know what's going on. I do think so. And to be, uh, not to be blind to it. And also to, um, I don't know, the, the compassion, yes. And also a sense of uh, being connected to the Four Noble Truths, right? Because if we just keep our own lives really happy, we look outside at the nice cherry tree and the birds flying above and the nice chocolate that one of the visitors brought, you know. It's kind of a bit worrying when we let that go to our head, we lose kind of, you know, perspective. So a bit of perspective is good. Thanks for the right um, reference there. Majima eight, Saleka Sutta. So it's the discourse on effacement. Yeah, I guess if there's nothing else, we'll wind up very soon. There is a uh, yeah, couple of texts. Uh, yeah, I'll just read through the last little yeah. things I see. So I agree, it's a way of stretching our compassion. We can't always turn away, but it's a balance. That's around reading the, the news. Someone else said, I find more peace the more I isolate. Sometimes there's a time for that. Sometimes there's a time. But I don't think we can live in that all the time. Mm -hmm. Someone else says, me too, associating with people can be very draining, even if they're reasonably wise. Correct. I mean, we all need different levels of quiet isolation, if you like. Isolation is a funny word because it's got a negative connotation, but solitude is important. But I think uh, also learning to be around others and find our boundaries there can be helpful too. Depends, doesn't it, on your lifestyle? You know, if you don't have to be, then maybe that's fine. I can't. I mean, people think I'm extroverted and love to talk. I don't. <laughs> I love solitude. I've been doing long retreats since I was 21. Um, I can be in silence for months, but it depends on what you're asked to do. I mean, as a monastic, you don't have a choice. You think it's your own time. It's not. You know, There's, uh, And that's great. It's a great practice. So we have to find more equanimity there. Yeah. So thank you very much, Venerable, Venerable Chanda and Venerable Upeka both, and for today's teachings and for giving us this opportunity to discuss, question, and uh, bounce back ideas from each other. Uh, it is a wonderful opportunity. Normally, you'll go and you'll listen to something, and then there is one question. But here, this is a discussion which is a totally different thing. And as you know, today's Sutta discussion is also offered on a donation basis. Um, as all these uh, Dhamma talks and uh, Sutta discussions and the regular events that Anukampa is having. So, with your generosity, Anukampa Bhikkhuni project um, can do continue this work and a lot of people will benefit and then there will be more Dhamma talks, teachings, meditation retreats as well. So how can you help? You can donate uh, different ways. There are different ways of donation. You can do that. And if you can, please uh, set up a standing order. And if you want to do a dana, a food dana, there is a food dana calendar uh, in the uh, website. And uh, if you want to um, do, you know, send some food or any other requisites, uh, you can contact team at anukampa.org. Uh, and discuss what you can do. You can do a supermarket delivery as well. You can do a remote food done as well. And also there is another list called needed items where the urgent needed things are written there. So um, that is what we can contribute. And uh, you can get lots of regular details if you subscribe to the newsletter. 
So please subscribe to the new newsletter so um, you will get the events um, and uh, regular events and uh, one or special events as well. So talking about the special events, in in June, uh, there is uh, Ajahn Brahmali's events. There are talks and there's a retreat. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Don't forget May. <laughs> yeah, so May is a, May. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just telling you yeah. off script from my mind. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. And uh, and uh, there is an online retreat um, from uh, by Venerable Chanda and um, uh, Ajahn Brahm. So uh, that is also there. And there is special events in May as well, <laughs> <laughs> which I can't okay. nice nice remember. <laughs> Please go to the anukampaproject.org slash events and um, you will see all those things and it gets updated. Thank you. Thank you, Manoi. Yeah, there's two day retreats in May um, with me. Uh, the first one is with Oxford Insight. So that's in Oxford. I haven't said where they are. Um, and I finally got a title for that. So that's in the chat. <laughs> Between sensing and craving, Vedana. So this is a little bit more exploring Patish Samipada, that particular uh, place where we react. And uh, May the 18th is on, I think, something like the Buddha's approach to death and dying something like that so anyway that's in bristol and um i'm off to norway on the 18th or 19th so next week you will have venerable Upeka and uh for your sutta discussion and also the meta meditation but tomorrow there's also a meta meditation with one of us and uh what else yeah I think that's all. But I mean, for those who are in England, it'd be lovely to see you in the monastery. So we hope that you can come and visit sometime soon. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's something I'm missing. But yeah, I think Manoi said the rest. So thank you very much. And thank you for your practice and your interest in the Dhamma. So we can wave goodbye now. And uh, we'll see you on Wednesday also for the meta uh, chanting. There for that. And then for me, it'll be a couple of weeks, I guess. You have any blue packer. All right. Take care.